Hello, good morning. It's Wednesday and this is Elevenses with Fran. How's your Wednesday going so far? Muddling along, coping okay? I told myself to juggle yesterday. So, you know, there are some upsides to having a lot of time at home. Uh, juggling, can you beat juggling? Anyway, <laughs> um, today's short story is by Dorothy Canfield Fisher, the amazing American writer, um, author of a Persephone favorite, The Homemaker, many of our favorites, I think. Um, <clears throat> Dorothy Canfield Fisher also brought uh, the Montessori method to America. And you'll see that, oh, look, I've got a frog in my throat. Is that still a phrase? <clears throat> Bad start. Okay, today's story is by Dorothy Canfield Fisher. It was written in 1937 and it's called The Rainy Day, The Good Mother and the Brown Suit. And before I start, for us nerds out there, in which I include myself, I'd just like to draw your attention to the sentence structure in the very beginning. The short story starts with the phrase, and yet, which all our English teachers told us never to do. But you'll see that here Dorothy Canfield Fisher um, uses, uses the unusual structure in such a brilliantly clever way. Okay, so on 11 is with Fran, it's very important you have a cup of tea. Have you got your cup of tea? Have you got a piece of cake or a muffin or a biscuit? Makes me feel a bit jealous. I want a piece of cake or a muffin or a biscuit. Um, anyway, uh, I chat while you settle down and get ready. And this short story is from the Persephone book of short stories, the first Persephone book of short stories, um, in case you want to track it down. All right, you ready? The Rainy Day, The Good Mother and the Brown Suit by Dorothy Canfield Fisher. And yet she had done exactly what the books on child training assured mothers would ward off trouble on a stormy day. She had copied off the list of raw materials recommended by the author of The Happy Child is the Active Child, coloured paper, blunt scissors, paste, pencils, crayons, plasticine. She had bought them all well ahead of time and had brought them out this morning after breakfast when the rain settled down with that all day pour. But unlike the children in books, Caroline and Freddie and little Priscilla had not received these treasures open-mouthed with pleasure, nor had they quietly and happily exercised their creative instinct, leaving their mother free to get on with her work. <laughs> Perhaps her children, her children hadn't as much of that instinct as other people's. At least, after a little listless fingering of coloured paper, Freddie turned away. Say, mother, I want to put on my brown suit, he said. Little did she dream then what the brown suit was to cost her. She answered casually, piling up the breakfast dishes. Oh, I washed that suit yesterday, Freddie, and the rain came, so it's not dry yet. Freddie trotted back and forth after her as she stepped to and fro with the slightly nervous haste of a competent woman who has planned a busy morning. But mother, she, he persisted, I want to put it on, I want to. He raised his voice. Mother, I want to put my brown suit on. From the pantry where she had just discovered that the cream she planned to use for the dessert was soured, she answered him with some asperity, I told you it wasn't dry yet. But she reminded herself of the excellent rule, always make children understand the reasons for your refusals and added, it's hanging on the line on the side porch. Look out there, dear, you can see for yourself how wet it is. He did so and stood staring out, leaning his forehead on the glass. Yet a little later, as she stood before the telephone, grocery list in hand, he tugged at her skirt and as Central asked, what number please, he said with plaintive obstinacy, mother, I do want to put on my brown suit. She said with considerable warmth, Somerset 361. Oh, for heaven's sake, Freddie, that suit is wet. Is this Perkins and Larson? How could you, how could you put it on? What price are your grapefruit today? Freddie, let go of my skirt. Grapefruit, I said. No, no, G for glory, R for run. But when she turned away from her struggle with the clerk, Freddie plucked at her hand and whimpered in the nasal fretting tone she had sworn before she had children no child of hers should ever use. Mother, I want to put on my brown. Don't whine, she told him, with a ferocity so swift and savage that he recoiled and was silent. She thought remorsefully, oh dear, to scold is just as bad as to whine. Going back into the pantry, she recalled with resentment that the psychologists of family life say the moods of children are but the reflections of the moods of the mother. She did not believe a word of it. 
did I start this? She asked herself unanswerably, and how can anybody help being irritated when they're so perfectly unreasonable? But she was really a very good mother. She remembered that the basis of child rearing is to understand each child at all times and went resolutely back into the other room, determined to understand Freddy if it were her last act. Disconcertingly, it was not Freddy, but Priscilla who ran to take her hand, who said pleadingly, timidly, as if appealing from the cruel decree of a tyrant, Mummy, Fred does so want, want to have you let him wear his brown suit this morning. The mother contained herself, collected the children, three-year-old Priscilla, five-year-old Fred, six-and-a-half-year-old Caroline, led them to the window and said, Now, just look at that suit. How could I let Freddy wear anything that's as wet as sop? At least, that was what she thought she said. What the children distinctly heard was, You're in the wrong, 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 and I am right, 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 as I always am, and there's no use you trying to get round that. <laughs> they stared gloomily out at this idea, rather than at the wet clothes. Their mother went on. What in the world does Fred want to wear his brown suit for anyway? What's the matter with the suit he's got on? What the children heard was, no matter what Freddie said his reason was, I'd soon show you it was all foolishness. They attempted no answer, shaken as they were, were by wave after invisible wave of her impatience to be done with them and at something else. Indeed, she was impatient. Why not with her morning work all waiting to be done? She held her children for a moment with the bullying eye of a drill sergeant and then said challenge, challengingly, well. She meant, and they knew she meant, I hope you realise that I have you beaten. Something in Fred, it was something rather fine, exploded with a crash. His round face grew grim and black. He looked savagely at his mother thrust out his lower jaw and, keeping his eyes ragingly on hers, kicked a footstool viciously as if he were kicking her. Freddy, she said in a voice meant to cow him, but he was not cowed. He kicked again with all his might, looking at his mother and hating her. And then, he was only a little boy. He broke. His hard, defiant face crumbled up into despair. He crooked his arm to hide his suffering from his mother from his mother and turned away to lean against the wall in the silent, dry, inexplicable misery which often ended what his mother called Fred's tantrums. Little Priscilla began a whimpering. Caroline put her hand up to her face and hung her head. Oh, their mother thought, her nerves taut with exasperation. I'd just like to see one of those child specialists manage my children on a rainy day. They'd find out a thing or two. But she loved her children, she loved them dearly. With her next breath, she was ashamed of being angry with them. The tears came to her eyes and an aching lump into her throat. Bewildered, dismayed, she asked herself in the purest surprise, but how did we get into this dreadful state? What can the trouble be? She went back into the pantry, took a long breath, took a drink of water, tried to relax, cast her mind back to the book about what to do on a rainy day. But she could not recall, but she could recall nothing else in it but that, that appealed to the creative instinct. She tried that and it had failed. She heard the front door open. The voice of a young cousin, no special favourite of hers, cried, ye gods and little fishes, what weather? <laughs> he slammed the door behind him. Although he was 19, he still slammed doors as if he were 12. He'd come as he sometimes did when it rained to wait in the living room for the bus that took him to college. One of its stopping places was their corner. Priscilla, the literal, asked, what does gods and little fishes mean? Mean, said the freshman, laughing and flinging his books and his raincoat, raincoat down on the floor. What do you mean, mean? You mean too much, Prissy. What does this mean? As she began to wash the dishes, the mother could see that he had flung his heels in the air and was walking on his hands. He's too old for such foolishness, she thought severely. And sure enough, one of the pockets of his adult suit of clothes, now upside down, Little boy junk rattled down around his hands. The children squealed and made a rush towards the bits of string, dirty handkerchiefs, knives, fishhooks, nails, pieces of cork, screws, pencils. No, you don't, said he, returning his feet to the floor with a bang. Everything there is part of an important enterprise. What's important enter... began Priscilla. Whatever I do, he told her coolly, were it only to make a mouse trap. If I made mousetraps, there'd be a four-strip concrete road to my door in a week's time, you bet. 
No mouse trap of mine would ever have let out Uncle Pete's mouse, believe me. What? Who? What's Uncle Pete's mouse? clamoured the children. Oh, surely you know that story. No child of our family gets brung up without hearing that one. No? Well, one morning when Uncle Peter and Aunt Molly came down to breakfast, Priscilla, do not ask who they were and where they lived, it's no matter. They found a mouse in their trap. It was the kind of trap that catches the mouse alive. So they got the cat and they all went out on the porch to open the trap and let the cat catch the mouse. Ugh. Priscilla, do not say this was horrid of them. It was and I can't help it, but that was the way it happened and it was so long ago, probably they didn't know any better. So there they all were. He illustrated how tensely they stood, stooping over an imaginary trap. The two children and Uncle Peter and Aunt Molly and the cat. She was scrooched right, <laughs> scrooched is a good word. She was scrooched right close in front of the cage. He quivered and crouched with such vivacity of acting that the children began to laugh while Uncle Peter slowly, slowly lifted the door of the trap till it was open enough for the mouse to get out. He drew a long breath and made a dramatic pause. The children gazed at him, mouths open, eyes unwinking. And then he sprang into the air. The cat jumped. He clutched at Fred. Uncle Peter hollered. He ran to Caroline and seized her arm. The children yelled bloody murder. He flung the children to right and left. Aunt Molly shrieked. He sank back on the floor. But the mouse was gone. He gazed with enormous solemnity at his spellbound listeners. That cat was prowling around, sniffing and lashing her tail. He sniffed the air and getting up on his hands and knees, lashed an imaginary tail. But there was no mouse. He sat cross-legged and earnest and went on. Well, Aunt Molly was terribly afraid of mice and she always had the idea that all a mouse wanted to do was to run up folks' clothes. So she was sure the mouse had done that to one of them. So she took one child and then the other and shook them till their teeth nearly dropped out. He shot out a long arm and seized Priscilla, Caroline and Freddy one after the other, shaking them hard and setting them into giggling fits and put first one and then the other inside the house and shut the door quick. Then she shook herself hard and went into the house and shut the door. Then Uncle Peter shook himself hard and went in quick and shut the door. And then they all had breakfast, wondering all the while about where that mouse could have got to. And after they'd finished their breakfast, Uncle Peter stood up to go to the office and took hold of the lower edge of his vest to pull it down. He seized the lower edge of an imaginary vest vigorously and stood appalled, a frantic expression of horror on his face. And there was the mouse! The children shrieked. It had been right under the edge of his vest. And when he grabbed the vest, he put his hand right around it. And when he took his hand away, the mouse was in it, squirming. He showed them how it squirmed. And then speeding up to express train speed, finished the story all in one breath. And he was so rattled, he flung it right away without looking where to see. And it went sprang into Aunt Molly's face and she fainted dead away. And the mouse beat it so quick they never did see it again. He grinned down at the children, literally rolling on the floor as pleased with the story as they. Say kids, what do you say we act it out? Let's, who'll be what? I'll be Uncle Peter. Priscilla, you be one of the children. Caroline, you be Aunt Molly, that's a swell part. You must yell your head off when I throw the mouse in your face. Fred, you be, I'll be the cat, said Fred, scrambling to his feet. So they acted out the little drama, throwing themselves passionately into their roles. Caroline so magnificent with her scream and faint at the end that Priscilla said, oh, I want to be Aunt Molly. So they did it over again. Priscilla screeching as though she were being flayed alive and fainting with fat arms and legs outstretched. I kind of like to be Uncle Peter, said Fred. OK by me, said the student. I'll be the cat. By the time they had finished it again, they were out of breath, what with screaming and running and laughing and acting and sank down together on the floor. Little by little, their laughter subsided to a peaceful silence. Freddy sprawled half over the knobbly knees of the tall boy. Priscilla was tucked away under his arm. Caroline leaned, leaned against him. From the pantry, where, unheeded, the mother washed the dishes, she thought jealously, what do they see in him? That story is nothing but nonsense. And then, she was really an intelligent person. It came over her. Why? Of course, that's just what they like in it. Out of the silence, 
almost as though she were thinking aloud, little Priscilla murmured, Freddie was bad this morning. There was compassion in her tone. What was eating him, asked the student, not particularly interested. He wanted to wear his brown suit and it was wet and he couldn't, so he kicked the footstool and was bad. What's the point about the brown suit, old man? The question was put in a matter-of-fact tone of comradely interest, but even so, Fred hesitated, opened his mouth, shut it, said nothing. It was Caroline who explained. You see, it's got a holster pocket at the back where he, where he can carry his pretend pistol. The mother in the pantry, astounded, remorseful, reproachful, cried out to herself, oh, why didn't he tell me that? But she knew very well why he had not. She had plenty of brains. Oh, I see, said the student. Well, why don't you sew a holster pocket on the pants you've got on, boy? On all your pants? It's nothing to sew on pockets. You girls, too. You might as well have holster pockets. When I was your age, I'd sewed on dozens of pockets. He took a long breath and began to rattle off nonsense with an intensely serious face and machine gun speed. My goodness, by the time I was 14, I had sewed on 534 pockets and one small watch pocket, but I don't count that one. Didn't you ever hear how I put myself through college sewing on pockets? And when I graduated, the president of the Pocket Sewing Union of America sent for me and... But you've only just got into college, Priscilla reminded him earnestly. In the pantry, her mother thought with a stab of self-knowledge, oh, why? Is that, is that me? Was I being little, literal like that about rainy day occupations? Ugh. Priscilla, said the college student sternly, don't you know what happens to children who say, go up bald head to their elders? Oh, but, he clutched his tousled hair and said, imitating Priscilla's serious little voice, Oh, but I'm not bald yet, am I? A horn sounded in the street. He sprang up, tumbling the children roughly from him and snatched his books. There's my bus, the door slammed. The children came running to find their mother. Oh, mother, mother, can we have some cloth to make pockets out of? She was ready for them. I've got lots of it that'll be just right, she said, telling herself wryly. I can get an idea all right if somebody will push it halfway down my throat. But for the rest of the morning, as the children sat happily exercising their creative instinct by sewing on pockets on their clothes, she was thinking with sorrow, oh, it's not fair, that great lout of a boy without a care in the world takes their fancy with his nonsense and they turn their backs on me entirely. I represent only food and care and refusals. I work my head off for them and the first stranger appeals to them more. Hmm. Yet after lunch, they put their three heads together and whispered, and giggled and had a secret. Then, Caroline at their head, they trotted over to the sofa where their mother had dropped down to rest. Mother, said Caroline in her little girl bird voice, wouldn't you like to play Uncle Peter and Aunt Molly in the mouse? You didn't have a single chance to this morning, not once you were working so. They looked at her with fond, shining eyes of sympathy. Come on, mother, you'll love it, they encouraged her. A lump came into her throat again. A good lump this time. She swallowed. Oh, thanks, children. I know I'd like to. What part are you going to have me take? The secret came out then. They let Freddie tell her, for it had been his inspiration. He looked proudly at his mother and offered her his best. Ye gods and little fishes, we're going to let you be the mouse. <laughs> she clasped her hands. Oh, children, she cried. From their pride in having pleased her, a gust of love madness blew across them, <laughs> setting them... Love madness, another excellent word. A gust of love ma madness grew, blew across... Try again. From their pride in having pleased her, a gust of love madness blew across them, setting them to fall, setting them to fall upon their mother like soft-pawed kittens wild with play, pushing her back on the pillows, hugging her, worrying her, rumpling her hair, kissing her eyes, her nose, whatever they could reach. But Priscilla was not sure they had been entirely clear. She drew away. You don't have to get caught, you know, she reassured her mother earnestly. The mouse wasn't caught. Never. Isn't that just the sweetest, most gorgeous story? And um, also quite relevant for these strange few days. I mean, it's not quite raining today, but it is rather grey. Um, I really hope you enjoyed that. Isn't Dorothy Canfield Fisher just the best? I adore her, I adore her, I adore her. I reread The Homemaker about twice a year, in fact. 
Um, so thanks for joining Elevens is with Fran today. We will do more tomorrow. Um, let me know your suggestions, what kind of short story you'd like to do tomorrow. This one today was from the Persephone book of short stories, in case you want to track it down. Um, all right, lovely having you all, and I will see you tomorrow.